Imagine waking up to a world that's as clear as your dreams. With Zeiss Smile Technology, this is your reality. At Fichte, Endel, and Elmer Eye Care, our mission is your vision. Conducted by a team of expert surgeons, leveraging leading edge technology, our procedure is safeguarded, swift, and tailored to your eye care needs. Say goodbye to the limits of glasses or contacts. Embrace a world where your vision keeps pace with your life's aspirations. Contact us today at 800-309-2020 or visit us online at ficta.com. At Ficta Endel and Elmer Eye Care, we are focused on you. Conduct. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. crown. I put in extra work that just can't be found. Work. I took the sword out the stone, wasn't a thing. Dang. Look me in my eyes, cause I'm a king. I'm a king. Look me in my eyes, cause I'm a king. Yeah. king. God made me punch in accurate numbers. Yeah. My castle won't crumble. Nah. What I tackle will fumble. Yeah. I've been a leader when they ain't see it, but now my feet is up. up. According to me, royalty didn't end with King Tut. Nah. Crown on my head, clouds is at my legs. Yeah. Big says sky is the limit. I look down on the ledge. I push the bar like I'm opening a cell. Hands in my cookie jar, you won't come out with a single nail. You I need on. all of mine. The weight of my shoulders won't fit on a scale. What's a king to a giant? What? Well, Goliath fell. Yeah. Even if we play in chess, dog, this king can't be checked. I make all my moves on the board. I invented my steps. Uh-huh. I'm a king, the blood of a ruler. I feel like Mansa Musa. Musa. Make your squad disappear like landing by the Bermuda. Triangle, look at it from my angle. I'm a king, the closest thing to being one of God's angels. Yeah. I'm a king. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. I put in extra work that just can't be found. Work. I took the sword out the stone, wasn't a thing. Dang. Look me in my eyes cause I'm a king. I'm a king. Look me in my eyes cause I'm a king. king. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. This is the Code of Conduct of the King Podcast. I am your host, Jay Spence the King. And I'm excited. I'm not going to even do too much talking because I have a very, very special conversation with three men who are legends in in this um, industry that we all want to work in and be in and and have fun in. So I'm I'm not again, I'm not going to talk too long. A couple points I did want to make. I did want to talk about how um, Josh Allen is not the problem. Uh, So anybody, if you got on Twitter, you had Twitter fingers and you and you felt like Josh was the problem. Or if you have a podcast or if you have an article that you write or if you're on ESPN, FS1 or any other network and you used your platform to say that Josh Allen was the problem at any point, you could talk about the interception, fine. But other than that one play, if you want to say that Josh Allen was a problem for the Buffalo Bills at all on Sunday, I just wanted to come and say you're wrong. Uh, you probably don't know ball. That's what I'm saying. They didn't say it. Nobody else said that. That's not Buffalo Rumblings. That's me. Because if you watch that game and you came away from it and you are saying that Josh Allen is not great and he's not clutch and he was the problem, I don't know what to tell you. Also, at some point, at some point, we have to stop um, excusing certain behavior. Okay. Again, this is not a Buffalo Romans thing. This is a me thing. Y'all can disagree with me. Y'all can hate it. Y'all can like it. Fans should not threaten players. Fans should not say things to players in certain ways. Security needs to get involved. But what I am going to say is that I don't care. People can get mad at me, whatever. It, it is what it is. Players are professional athletes. In no way should a player ever approach a fan in the form or fashion which we saw some Bills players approaching Eagles fans. If that's the case, you get them kicked out. You get them banned. It is a privilege to go to an NFL game. I don't care how much money you have. If you are banned, it is a privilege that you will not be able to, you just won't be able to do it. So at that point, I think that's what needs to happen. It should never be where a player is getting in the face of a fan potentially putting hands on the, on a fan. That's my opinion. That's my point of view on it. I think it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Now, on the other hand, I think the fans should be embarrassed. You spend a lot of money to go to these games, to watch these guys play. You spend money to watch these guys play. 
And then you want to come and be disrespectful and threaten these guys, families and do things that are inappropriate. We got to relax. We got to relax. But anyway, let me uh, get out the way, because, again, I'm excited about this conversation that I am about to have. Uh, this is a special edition of the Code of Conduct. It is a bye week, but it's still uh, special for me because I haven't done interviews much as of late. And I got three guys. Uh, two of them happen to be, you know, network mates or co-workers or however you want to word it. And then the other is is another legend that uh, he has his own podcast he has his own network he works with the bills he does the broadcast he does some of everything so we got jerry ostrowski we got john fina and eric wood and i am excited for this episode of code of conduct and we are calling this episode the line hey football fans the season is here so you know that means family football and food but for the nfl's best fan base it can't be just any food bills mafia only eats the best during the season and the best is picasso's pizza with four great locations in Western New York, it's so easy to treat yourself to the most flavorful pizza on game day. Picasso's. We are Buffalo Pizza. Shipping local and nationwide. Order online at picassospizza.net. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited. I've been waiting for this one. We've been talking about it, and now it's here. I am I'm honored to sit down with three of the greatest offensive linemen that the Buffalo Bills have ever employed. I have... All, all worldly John Fina, all worldly Eric Wood, and all worldly Jerry Ostrowski. It's the, it's the. I don't even know what nickname to give you guys. I should have pre-thought that up. But this is an awesome opportunity for me, man. Let's let's start with Jerry. What's up with you, man? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Re just realize he got seventy and seventy and sixty, so that's about right. Like seventy first round guy, seventy first round guy, and then ten, at least ten percent less. That, that's me. So. <laughs> I, this this is perfect, believe me. No, but, I wouldn't, no I'm, I wouldn't I'm go happy to be you, here. It's uh, it's it's a good deal. I, I appreciate you having us on. Legendary man, like this is a big <laughs> deal. So, Eric, how you doing, man? Man, I'm all good. Enjoying the bye week so far. Don't have to travel for a Bills game this weekend. Get on the call, and you know, you, you reach out about talking offensive line. You know, generally, I get pulled on to different media appearances, and they want to hear about the offensive coordinator, Josh Allen, or why do we run cover zero blitz? And we may get to those things as well, but you brought up the offensive line. I said, yeah, we'll get that in, Spence. Well, you know what, because I, I think it's such an underrated part of the game, which, at, you know what, I think in, for Buffalo, I can't say I think it's underrated because I think Buffalo is one of the towns where, you know, you go to a bar in Buffalo, they know the offensive linemen, they know what college you went to, they know your strengths and your weaknesses. So may, it might not be underrated as far as Western New York, but I, I do think that, you know, it's something that it just isn't talked about enough unless there's like a top five or a top 10 guy on that unit. And, you know, I think the Bills... We have a we have a history of of having greats, and I think this is a good opportunity to showcase that. John Fina, what's up, man? Hey, hey, Spence. Happy to be here with two legends of the Buffalo O line community, and I too enjoy talking offensive line play, mostly because uh, that's what I know best, right? Um, people ask me what positions my son sons play in football, and I say I only raise offensive linemen. I, I don't know any other positions, so. That that's uh it's a great honor to be with these two gentlemen and of course with you, sir. Well, let's get right to it. Uh the Bills, obviously, we just to me a heartbreaking game that I feel like in a way was a must win. I know it doesn't eliminate us from playoff contention, but I mean it it was it's a heartbreaker. Um the the first question is really as as simple as I can get it. Last season, it seems like it, almost after every game, even though we were 13 and three, even though the offense was the second best in the league. And even though, you know, I can throw a bunch of positive bullet points out there. The questions were always about the offensive line and about Spencer Brown. And this year, I don't think we talk about the offensive line really at all. You know, if we, if we mention it, it might be too many penalties in the second quarter here, or, but, but really we don't talk about it. What, what changed? I'll throw, I'll start this one out, uh, tossing this to Eric and then uh, we'll swing it around to, to Jerry and John. Well, you mentioned Spencer Brown by name, so I'll start with him. He has an offseason in his second year where he can't even prepare for the season as an offensive lineman. He's simply rehabbing a back, and I don't know if you guys injured your backs before. Uh, I'm, I'm sure me, Jerry, and John all have, and maybe you as well, Spence. I mean, when your back's bothering you, 
I mean, it's the absolute worst. You can't move at all without discomfort. And he was playing through that for a while. Then he comes back. And, you know, that first year after surgery, you're never quite the same. And so, you know, this year he has played well. Everyone made a big deal about that Steelers game in the preseason where they didn't really game plan and they're leaving him on on an island simply to evaluate him. And he gets beat one time. Obviously, you know, there was a big play to be made down the field. We don't get it. So everyone says Spencer Brown is who we thought he was. And now he's played very consistent this year. Deion Dawkins is playing at a super high level. Yes. But when we talk about what's changed, it's the guard play this year. And this is no knock on Roger Saffold. And it's no knock on Bates from last year. Bates is a, a valuable piece to this offensive line as that sixth guy that could really play all five positions, but really solidifies the inside. But Osiris Torrance brings some more size. Has he had his struggles at times this year? Sure, any rookie will when he's transitioning to the NFL. Did he get beat by Jalen Carter a couple of times last week? Yeah, but Jalen Carter is likely the defensive rookie of the year this year. And then Connor McGovern comes in from Dallas, and he has played very well. He's sitting right between Mitch Morse and Deion Dawkins, and that left side of the line is very strong. And, you know, he talked about we're not even mentioning him. Well, I mentioned Mitch Morris last. In these last two seasons, I felt like he's played incredible. He's very athletic. He's long in pass protection, which is rare for a center, so you can leave him on an island. But that group up front is very, very strong. And some of the stuff they do in the run game, I was texting with Deion Dawkins earlier this week, just trying to encourage him a little bit. That, that was like my little brother. Uh, he came into the offensive line room. My last year in the league, we put him at left tackle when Cordy Glenn went out, and me and Richie were like, look, dude, we got you. You have the right mentality. You got the tangibles. He's as athletic as any O-lineman I've been around, and he's developed into such a great player. But the way he's pulling across the formation, Fina, you can speak into this, but rarely on counters, traps, uh, power gap scheme type runs do you pull the tackle. Well, that was always a hard block when you had to get back to a three technique as a center and you're pulling the guard. Well, nowadays, they'll script it so they get the three technique on the backside so the guard can block back and Dion pulls around and he has been a wrecking ball when he pulls. John, you want to, I know he just said you can kind of speak to that. So you want to take that and kind of run with it? Yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit and then uh, kind of, delve into your question about last year and why people want to blame the offensive line because I, I have a little bit of a, a different take on it. But what I love, it's it's a zone scheme, Eric, right? Going to the left and typically you would see maybe a guard pull on power and that really puts the center in a bind blocking back on, an, on a really active three, just like you mentioned. So what we can do now, instead of relying on a tight end to come across the formation and kick out the defensive end, which is uh, you know, no offense to tight ends everywhere, but y'all don't block really well. So we can we can take the tight end and he can cut off the backside, which ostensibly is the side we're running zone to, and take a big athletic cat like Deion Dawkins and run him across the formation. No defensive end wants to stare that in the face. And that's the rub, right? You can't do that with every tackle in the league. And we don't run it the other way. Spencer maybe the back, or maybe it's just not his thing. He doesn't move as well. And you could argue, well, then it becomes predictable. So far, it hasn't. And he does a hell of a job at it. I'll agree with you, Mitch Morse. And the way I think about offensive line playing is this, and assessing it is you haven't heard a lot of names called, right? So if you're not hearing your name called, if people aren't talking about you on the offensive line, generally, you're doing a good job. Uh, and it, it's reflected in the sack count this year, too. I guess we're 31st in the league, you know, lo- least amount of sacks. But going back to this idea that, oh, I'm just going to, when things go bad, they're going to sour on the offensive line. Why do people do that? Because it's the most intricate group, position group, with the most players that's least understood by the general public. So you can lash out at the offensive line. Don't substantiate your claim whatsoever, and people will generally just accept it, especially if you are some paid mouthpiece who just (laughs) flies off, doesn't study film, and wants to say something. Because nobody can really – well, and all I say is give me a play. Tell me the five plays you didn't like by Torrance or McGovern. And people generally kind of, you know – put their finger on their lip and blah, 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 they, they can't really respond. So I think if you're willing to push back 
on people who take shots at offensive line play, you'll find that their knowledge base is almost as deep as a puddle. Yeah. And and I'm sorry if I'm offending some viewership out there, but it's a lot to learn. And it took me, you know, 15 years of playing it all the time. And there's still more to learn. You're exactly right. And it happens to me on the broadcast all the time because they'll want me to assign blame. Right. And I'll say, look, that's a free hitter. I don't know if that was on Josh. I don't know who it was responsible for up front. It right. could have been a tight end. It could have been the running back. I'm not sure who that free hitter is on. And people will say, well, you, you played. And I said, yeah, but I didn't play under Ken Dorsey. I didn't play under Joe Brady. I didn't play under Brian Dayball, which at times allows me to speak freely on the broadcast because I'm not ever giving away company secrets. You know, I, I, never, right. I, I never played in there. So that actually helps me at times. Uh, now it does help me that I've played under Sean McDermott so I can give some insights into maybe what he's thinking and what he would tell us in meetings or preparation wise. But, you know, for me, you know, I played with Dion and I follow this team around the country week to week. And there's even times where I can't give blame and dole it out. And so the fact that people want to say that pro football focus can give a guy a bad grade and then all of a sudden that skews the fan opinion, it, it really pisses me off. Right. Uh, and and believe me, pro football focus, you know, they do serve a purpose. But yes, they give information that that is very confusing. People don't understand their grades and how they grade. And it's uh, yeah, it's dangerous because a lot of people rely on it and they can get to it. Right. There's access. But no, my my viewpoints are uh, just to piggyback what Eric had to say earlier. I think we've gotten really good up the middle. Um, I thought that I thought that was an area of concern on both sides of the ball. And I thought with with Torrance and McGovern, they've done a wonderful job at guard. And it kind of morphs into what I think the overall, to me anyway, the the overall um, betterment of the line this season is they've become much more of a physical type of offensive line. I think Dion is just, he's finishing blocks. He's 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 playing physically. Um, his, his play has gone up exponentially. Spencer, now that he's healthy, we always known he was a big physical right tackle. Now he's able to do it because he's healthy. He's had a year of training under his belt. He's not, you know, wasn't trying to get back from that back injury. Torrance is a guy that's a people mover. He can grab guys moving from point A to point B. Um, He's a big physical guy. A guy to play tackle his entire career in in college and then comes down inside with, with the Bills. But then McGovern was the guy that I wasn't quite sure of. Had seen him play a little bit uh, in Dallas. Thought he was more of a move guys with his feet as far as running and those types of things, creating space with his athleticism, but he's shown physicality as well. So that group uh, up front just is is imposing their will more, I think, than they have last season. And I think that's been a big deal, especially as the, as the year's gone along. You look at this last couple of games and Cook's starting to heat up. They're getting him room inside to run. And um, the other thing I think Brady's done real well is he's, he's made that – his offense is a little more user-friendly up front. Um, those guys don't get put – on an island very much. I think that they um, there's a lot of play action. There's a lot of stuff where running backs are coming out of the backfield and the fits by the back look like it's going to be run, and then they're hitting the flat, things like that. So between those three things, I think that group has done a wonderful job as far as playing uh, better this season than they did last season. And back to the original question for one second, this is also year two under Aaron Cromer. Yeah, Aaron exactly. Cromer comes in. He was previously with Sean McVay. They were used to Bobby Johnson and Brian Dayball's offense. Well, then you switch the scheme up, and it's completely different. Right. And you're asked to do different things as an offensive lineman. And so you look at that, and, and, and it takes some time. When you're learning new techniques, I played under Aaron Cromer in Buffalo. I gave him a strong endorsement to Sean McDermott when Sean asked me about bringing him in, and I said, look, I think he's the best offensive line coach technicality-wise and teaching schemes and kind of this new age of, look, not every play is bashing into people. I played under Joe Dallas-Andrus, who's in Baltimore, and I think he's excellent. I think he's excellent at – getting a group to band together and play physical. Right. I think Aaron Cromer is excellent at teaching techniques, individual techniques at that, where Connor McGovern's not going to be asked to do the same pass sets on a down to down basis as Osiris source because they have different skill sets. And I really appreciated that about Aaron. Now he will have you do some things technique wise. It's kind of 
a lot of the concepts are Bill, uh, Bill Callahan based where if you, if you're not used to it, it's just going to take you time to learn. Well, now it's year two under those blocking schemes and blocking techniques. And you're seeing guys win more one-on-ones. Well, <laughs> dovetailing on what you said, time, right? You got the collective bargaining agreement and these coaches have so little time really to work on technique and to have these sort of philosophical discussions. And there's so much nuance to offensive line play. Going back to what you said about Spencer Brown, he struggled his first year playing, and it wasn't a lack of skill set. It's the nuance. I see it a little bit in Osiris Torrance. There's nuances to playing at this level that you don't just pick up from film and you don't pick up from practice. The only way to absorb it, the only way, is through game experience. And, you know, I can't speak so much to Cromer and the change in philosophy and technique. But the one thing you have to have is you got to have a leader at the at the line coach position who the guys will believe in. Right. So right. there's obviously a belief going on here. They think that they can derive success within the scheme. And with the trio of running backs, the James Cook, I think, accentuates the offensive productivity on the O-line because he he has the ability to jump cut and accelerate quickly. He's also picked up the nuance of the patience, the weight, and then hit the hole. He accelerates incredibly well. Latavius Murray has his own skill set that works with us. And then Ty Johnson has just been a, I mean, I mean, I'm pie-eyed and excited to have the guy on the team. He's been so productive. You know what you so you bring up you bring up James Cook. And that was a question that I actually wanted to ask you guys, because from an offensive lineman perspective, again, you talk about last year and and not just last year, talk about years since we've had Josh Allen at quarterback. It seems as if, um, yeah, you can look at the overall numbers. And when you include Josh Allen's numbers, it's like, yeah, the Buffalo Bills have one of the best running attacks in the league. You take it out. And we're middle of the pack, it seems. So the running game just hasn't been strong since LaShawn McCoy, really. This year, we have a top running back. You know, any in any metric that you want to put, we have a top running back. Um, and it was like that with Ken Dorsey. And it's still like that even after Ken Dorsey is, is you know, transitioned on now to Joe Brady. Is there a, is it a different scheme? Are we running different? Pl- like what what has changed this year, offensive line standpoint or or scheme or what's changed now that the running game now looks like okay, this is a team that if we do make the playoffs, I don't know if we, that's a different conversation, but if we do, it's scary because teams that can run the ball with a quarterback and play defense, those teams can can make some noise. So from that perspective, what's changed? Well, I'll say this year they've stuck with it longer. Some of thank you, thank you, thank you. Most of high production comes in the second half of game where yeah. they're still wearing on teams. Like, right. look, we're not going to even when Shady uh, led the league in rushing, we we weren't we didn't have many games where even in the first half we're over 100 yards. Right. But then all of a sudden at the end of the game, we have over 250 yards rushing because we were able to wear on them. One of my favorite drives of the entire season, it sucks that it comes in uh, in a loss, but the fourth quarter, the Bills need a touchdown drive to take the lead, and they put the ball on the ground four straight plays and run the ball right down the Eagles' throat. Well, you know what? It's hard for us to get our fits early in games. The defensive line's juiced up. We're still getting used to the silent snap count. There are so many factors that go into why your fits might not be perfect early in a game, and part of it's what John said. We're practicing without pads on all week. The quarterbacks and receivers, they can get their timing. For us, you know, it's glorified walkthroughs this time of the season. You're not even allowed to practice in pads at this point of the season right now. And so they've stuck with it longer. But, you know, there's only so many – stats as an offensive line that you can take pride in and you could even cherry pick sack numbers and say Josh Allen avoids a lot of sacks but don't get me wrong you drop back 60 (laughs) times against the Eagles and give up one sack and really he was only touched maybe twice in the pocket where besides maybe three including that one roughing the passer well you know the sack numbers are so far down that's so encouraging but James Cook has I believe the second highest yards before contact in the high in the entire nfl that's what you call now it's also a smart running back finding the opening gaps and his vision has improved i get all that but they're getting their fits and they're moving guys to where they're getting him to the second level of defense and that allows him to go then make plays no exactly i I, I, 
Go ahead, Jerry. I was just going to say my my main point is what Eric said. I mean, the commitment to the running game is what you have you have to do. I mean, the commitment hasn't been there, and now the commitment to the running game, and especially with so many DBs in today's defenses having to play so much run support, especially contain and getting downhill, it's set up these plays with it's setting up these plays with the backs out of the backfield and all of that. I think that to to be committed like that or especially early even though you know like eric said you have some of those things that you're worried about um yeah man i mean i think that's a big deal i i would say this <clears throat> since shady and buffalo which running back have we had who can press the edge none and i think that dimension of him getting outside the tackles and able to pick up a few yards. And it doesn't have to be a 10-yard gain or an 8-yard gain. If you can get out on the edge, outside the tackles, and pick up three to five yards, the defense has to understand and respect that. And that, in turn, opens up the middle. You can make outside run look and still run the ball up the middle. I think that gives us a hell of a lot more latitude. And, and to what Eric was saying about your fits. I think there's a simplified nature to this, this game plan and the run where guys know who they're on and they're able to get, uh, uh, like Eric said, if no people don't know, get your fit. I mean, getting in the proper position. I always look at it as the running back, as he, as he approaches the line of scrimmage, should only see the nameplates of his offensive line. So when guys are getting into position, they're asked to do things that are in front of them and out, not outside their scope. They can get into that fit, and that creates natural creases and a guy that you know is further downfield before he gets touched than any other running back. We, hey, the three of us love to hear that. That, and I'll tell you, there's five guys in a locker room at one Bills drive who are kind of like, yeah, hell yeah, brushing their shoulder off. That, yeah, that's no a doubt. great and, point of pride. And then these last two weeks, so James Cook, his last three games goes over a hundred yards of scrimmage. So in today's day and age of the NFL. It's not always going to be, you know, 20, 20, 25 rushes a game. What I like what they've been doing lately is getting the ball to him in space and on time. James Cook, earlier in the season especially, was kind of that check down, get it to him late. Well, then it's hard for him to use as athleticism. We've seen, especially early in games, this week he ran out of bounds a yard before the sticks on one of these swing passes, which I was in the booth cringing over, like, come on, bro, lower your shoulder early in the game, stick it to the TV. <laughs> but uh, that being said, they've given him the ball in space and quick enough. And Joe Brady, I thought he had two awesome schemes against the Jets. The one that was the Ty Johnson touchdown where you get him in man-to-man -man defense, but it's fourth and one, so you tell Gabe Davis to give that guy a little pick. Well, if he picks him, you punt the ball away anyways, and if they call it, so what? But – Instead, you get a 49-yard touchdown, and then the one in the red zone, they got him in man-to-man -man defense again, and they run three guys across the formation with Cook coming out the other way. In man-to-man, -man, you can't stop that, especially not when you have speed like Cook. And isn't it amazing how all of a sudden when you commit to the running game, the quarterback run all of a sudden opens up, and they're not sitting back there waiting for you to call quarterback runs. They just happen because – you've established the run and, and, you know, you're worried about so many other things. So it's just amazing how much other things, how many other things open up when you, when you decide to commit to running the football, especially, you know, what the bills have done over the last so many weeks. And look in today's day and age of the NFL, I'm not asking for the bills, especially with Josh Allen, a quarterback right. who was on the outside. I'm not asking them to be an exclusive run team. Uh, we're all of our point I'm, I'm sure is you have to be effective in running the football and keeping defenses honest right because, man you play the Pittsburgh Steelers with Watt on the outside and I mean every team's got these high-end pass rushers nowadays I mean if you don't keep those guys honest they're a nightmare for us up front and you can keep them honest with those swing passes in the back get the ball to your hands quick right. and all that but just don't expect me to pass protect 50 times a game as a, as a tackle in this league against these high end pass rushers with no threat of the run and be successful. Right. And on the yeah. flip side, so do you want to, you know, somebody says you want you know, they demand to give the ball to cook. You know, I had somebody say the other day, they want to, they want to have the ball 35 times. Well, I don't necessarily want to take the ball to Josh Allen's hands that many times. I'll, I'll yeah, let him have right. 20 maybe, but I'd like Josh to yeah. have it quite a bit too. 
When I saw that statistic about the lowest, near the lowest sack numbers, and I, I immediately thought someone's going to say it's because Josh evades sacks. And if anybody says that to you, I think what you say is, hey, nobody drafts a statue anymore. All these guys have escapability. And in fact, you can't tell me that as you're going to draft a quarterback, you're not looking at his ability to get out of a difficult spot. So the fact that he does it, I just add that as like, that's part of his job description, right? You There are five guys up front. You scheme to block five. They bring a guy off the edge that we're not accounted for. They want Eric to blame the offensive line. It might sometimes I sometimes I'll review film and you guys do the same thing. And you're looking at it, you're looking at it, and you're like, that's the quarterback's guy. And I had people say, What do you mean the quarterback can't block a guy? And I'm like, Well, he can't block the guy, but he's got to account for him. He's got to know where the free rusher's coming from. That's his job. His job is to avoid sacks. His job is to throw the ball. It all comes together. And I think by and large, balance of the running game, as these gentlemen have said, the number of swing passes we're using, getting the ball into our, our running back receivers' hands is, has really helped balance it out. So we're not sitting back there. And the tackles specifically haven't been a tackle my whole life. We're going, you know, just sitting there going, dear God, I got another drop back against this guy who's just an absolute monster. That is just, it's just too much. By the end of the game, you've had it up to your eyeballs and above, and you're like, man, I can't even believe I survived. I couldn't believe the last game. The Eagles, they only had seven carries with their running backs in the first half. They throw the ball on the first four plays of the game with an injured right tackle. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Now in the second half, they get back to a balanced attack, and the Bills had plenty of chances and a bunch of mistakes and penalties and missed field goals and everything else that allowed the Eagles to stay within 10 points, or else maybe they couldn't have got back to that. But you saw what happened when the Eagles, all of a sudden they start running the football in the second half oh, wait, now the pass protection is so much better and Leonard Floyd's not in Jalen Hurts' face every single play. Let, let me ask you two guys, is there anything more disgusting to you as an offensive lineman than the first drive of the game, you come out and sling it three in a row? I, I'd have been heading to the sideline just screaming my head off. <laughs> what in the hell are you doing to us? Well, we would have said we would have screamed the night before the game when we got the opening script and said, "Hey, what are we <laughs> doing here?" Like, especially the Bills where they play exclusively nickel defense. Like, let's right. at least mix in some run here. I mean, if you look at how depleted this defense is, and you know Milano's out and Daquan Jones, like, let us wear on these guys. Von Miller is still not himself. Like, let us wear on these guys up front a little bit, and then go start dropping back over and over. Once we've got the upper hand, you know what you mentioned Von Miller, and this is something that I actually I had planned to ask you uh, because I saw that you had actually made a comment um, to to someone about it. A lot of fans and, and people who don't quite understand. Obviously, we're talking offensive line play, but from an offensive lineman's perspective, perspective or just knowing football on the level that you do uh, this particular play uh, with Von Miller. He, for those <laughs> listening by podcast, you, you can't quite see this, but there's a play where uh, there's been some criticism of, of his, you know, I guess he was kind of, I guess, going after the quarterback. I believe it was a stunt. Is that, That's kind of where I'm at with it. But I'm a podcaster. So uh, Eric had, you, you had some interaction where you tried to explain um, what you saw here. Uh, can you kind of go into that? And then if Jerry and John also want to jump in and talk about what they're seeing out of Von Miller at this point. Yeah, so this is an ET stunt. So that means right. the end's going the first, the tackle's wrapping around, and you know, I understand he's got to deflect off of that. So he's going to pick the guard or right. center, um, whoever is going to get in his way. Here he catches the guard's hip, and now you have the defensive tackle, the guy lined up as a three technique there. He's wrapping around. I believe the reason they did this in this situation on third and seven was – when you start running ET games, your ends are inside and your tackles are looping, it gives the quarterback the feeling that he has the edge. Well, Jalen Hurts was killing the Bills right. with the scramble. So you run those ET stunts or even TE stunts where the tackles go out, pick the ends, but you're more susceptible to QB scrambles when you run TE stunts. So they run this ET, and I know everyone wants to see Vaughn rush the passer, and I do as well, and he's just not quite all the way back yet. He's not himself, but that clogs the middle where – Jalen Hurts cannot scramble up the up the field, up the middle, 
And then once he feels like, oh, shoot, those defensive ends came inside, I'm going to go outside the pocket, the defensive tackles have to contain. Yeah, because the original way to stop that on the quarterback read was they would bring the end inside to give a false pull look, and when the quarterback pulled it, they would scrape the linebacker over top and he would be there. Well, teams have started to catch on to that, and they'll read that linebacker and a lot of times throw off of him. So now they run that stunt in that run situation to to disguise that look. They get their contained player without giving away uh, pass coverage and other things like that. Yeah, you don't have to get, you don't have to give up the curl, right? Because the right. linebacker is still sitting in the hole. Right. I just thought it was funny. I, I didn't even know Eric that you had commented on it yet. I, I saw it on Twitter, and it took me all of like you know one watch to go. It's a pick stunt. Like, and that again goes right. back to my comment earlier. You know, Von Miller got hurt for God's <clears throat> sakes. He's coming back from an ACL. He is not Superman, and this will take time. And I think he's actually he's trying to trust it more. I see some flashes of 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 his moves that he likes, and I, I think he's coming along. I you can't put a timeline on it, and you can't put the the timeline on when he feels mentally ready. You know that that he can trust that knee. So, but I just think it's so funny that somebody doesn't can't even dissect a play wants to trash a guy that's going to the Hall of Fame. I mean, check yourself. Otherwise, Eric and Jerry O are gonna wreck you. I mean, well, when on, have dude. you ever when have you ever seen a, a a defensive lineman stunt for a pass rush situation where he gets a yard upfield and then basically goes ninety degrees and runs straight down the line of scrimmage? I mean that's not what they do, right? They're trying to get in gaps and get upfield. So, yeah, obviously it was a stunt. But you're right. I mean, ACLs are hard enough to get back from. At the age of 30-something, it's even tougher. Hey, and yeah, there's not a there's not a defensive end that wants to say, yeah, I'll give up my chance for a sack, right? So this is a true team player. You're asked to go in there, and you're basically saying, I'm giving up my best skill set to, to get a sack, in order to free up my guy to my right, who's going to get a sack? Right. I mean, that's that, that's your contribution right there on that play. And yeah, you, you can you tell make that how, sacrifice. You can tell a selfish D lineman with how quickly he ricochets off of his pick. <laughs> if he if he's going in there looking to ricochet immediately to the quarterback, the the pick stunt's not going to work. But he's selfish and he's trying to get to the passer. And John, you were talking about earlier when you have when you're a tackle and you're going up against the same guy over and over throughout the game on pass rush. Now he can set you up. And I've said this on the broadcast a few times this year. Von Miller, throughout his career, I played against him multiple times. It wasn't in the first quarter that he'd rack up a three-sack game. It was in the second half where he had set you up, where he hit you with that ghost move and that stutter step. It's the spin move inside because he's ran that edge so many times. It's that one time he puts his foot in the dirt and goes right down the middle of you, and Von is deceptively strong at 255. And so Von's Von played 21 snaps the last game, and I know everyone wants to say, you know, in 21 snaps, you need to be doing better. And look, Von's even saying to himself, look, I'm not playing up to my standard. Like, I'm not, but I'm trying, and I'm trying to get back to there. But Von is the type of guy that sets you up. He's super intelligent. And so he has no time right now to even set up his moves for later in the game. And then I don't know that he's got – the strength or the power to kind of convert to that right. bull rush that he could catch you on. I mean, he would hit, he looped around. I actually gave up. I could probably count the amount of sacks I gave up in my career on one hand. And one of them was Devon Miller. Now he never touched Kyle Orton on the play. Kyle Orton took a dive in the backfield before Vaughn even got there and it ticked me off so bad, but Vaughn came around on a stunt. He looped to me and I thought he was going to make a move. He gave me a little stutter and went right down the middle of me. Now I went back two or three yards and Kyle ducked in the dirt but that's what Vaughn can do, but he's just not getting enough reps throughout the game to even be able to set any of that up. I think I think what people are misinformed on is most most great pass rushers work power to speed, not speed to power. And that's where I think you're having some of the issues with Vaughn as you talk about just not having that power that he and explosiveness off that repaired knee yet. But most great pass rushers are power to speed, and that's where that ghost movement stuff comes in. And I think I think again like John talked about earlier, um, you know, people's knowledge of the offensive line position is as shallow as a puddle. I think sometimes people don't understand just how much work goes into being a great pass rusher because those guys probably study as much or more than, than most positions, you know, maybe even quarterback. 
Yeah, and this this can't go exempt either. The way this defense has reeled at times this year because of all the injuries, we played a lot of tight games where teams right. are staying two dimensional. I mean, you look back at the Rams <clears throat> game last year where Vaughn comes in and makes his big splash in LA going against his former team. The Bills won that game 31 to 7. They were up two scores the entire second half, and Vaughn's teeing off over and over, and he ends up with two sacks, and he's the hero of the game. And everyone's talking about how smart Brandon Bean is because he paid. Von Miller, and everyone thought he might have been too old. Well, he got 25 pass rush at, attempts in the second half, and he got hung right. twice. You know, and as an offensive lineman, that always ticks you off because you blocked him well 23 times, and you're judged upon the <laughs> two. But he's just – he's not getting that type of work, especially in the second half of games right now. Well, I, I guess what I would say, you know, uh, I, I don't begrudge, begrudge a guy getting injured, and he's doing his damnedest to get back. You know, there might be people who should say he shouldn't even be in the game because it doesn't help us. But if he's going to be full speed or as close to 98, 95 percent next year, he still needs that experience. Uh, and if we get eliminated from the playoffs, I think that the play would be get Von Miller in even more. Get him just get him ready. Make sure that, you know, he feels comfortable by the time the end of the season comes, because there's not a lot going on in the off season where you get that kind of stress where you have to leverage your body and work the moves that you know historically have made him legendary and you know I'm, I'm hopeful for Vaughn I, I hate to see a guy you know suffer that way I, I give him full props for getting in there and, and doing his recovery on the field and you know just uh, I, I think we're fortunate that we got some other really decent players and a, and a great one in Leonard up front that you know are picking up the slack. And let's be honest, Adrian Peterson ruined it for every guy to get an ACL injury the rest of the if for the, <laughs> for the foreseeable future in the NFL. Adrian Peterson comes off an ACL injury after seven months. He's practically Wolverine and he sets the rushing record. <laughs> and everybody thinks we should all be able to do that. Right. I, now, look, I played seven months after an ACL and I grinded through that next season. And at times, I felt awful. It took me about 18 months before I felt fully ready to go again. That was also when I was 25 years old when that happened. And so a lot younger, a lot heavier than Bond. But, you know, it took me 18 months to where I felt like really good, where I'm not going in the training room before a game and getting my knee drained because it, sw- it got so swollen throughout the week from practicing on it. Like, we don't know exactly what he's dealing with. And all, CL- all ACL injuries are different. I mean, we could say this guy did this when he came off an ACL. This guy did this. I'm not writing Vaughn off that he can't come back next year and be just as explosive as the guy we saw at the start of last season. Right. Well, you know, so you talk about. Now, we, we, we started this podcast talking about O line play, Spence, and now it's become like the Von Mil- defend Von Miller. <laughs> well, no, because well, it was still. Where so are we I going, man? Where are we going? <laughs> Well, for that play, I just wanted a perspective because I, I feel like a lot of times, like you mentioned about offensive line play, I also feel like, you know, as a as a fan, I'm even like, man, it's Von Miller. He's supposed to be rushing the quarterback. And then, you know, from your perspective, a lot of times, you know, as a listener, we don't get this perspective all the time. And I get it now. Everybody does. You know, there's a ton of podcasts out there. And, you know, I know Eric has a pod and I know that both of you have pods. But still, like sometimes to get direct answers like this, um, it's a special treat. So, you know, when I saw that question several times, I saw how viral it went. So for me to, to hear that from the three of you, man, I needed that. And, you know, but but so we're talking about this, though. And, and so we're six and six. Right. So we're at the point now where it's it's crunch time. It's like, OK, the offensive line, we just talked about how good the offensive line has played this year. They're not a problem or the problem with this team. What's what? How do how do we get into the tournament from here? How how, how do we like like what? I don't even know how to ask this question, man. Like this seems so un- unprofessional now. I'm sorry, but but it's like, where do we go from here? I'm I'm just frustrated as a fan. Where do we go? You got to get on a roll at this point because you got five games left and you either got to win four right. or five of those. Now, the good thing is if the Bills do get in the playoffs, they're going to be one of the hottest teams in football and no one's going to want to play them. And these young guys that are getting more experience on defense like Dotson and Bernard and these guys that are filling in for those guys that got injured, hopefully as a unit, they can build some more continuity. I also think one of the issues this year has been special teams. It's been field position. It's been missed kicks. It's been not great punts, it's been penalties, and they've really let this team down because when all those injuries happened on the defensive side of the football, I said, look, 
this offense is going to have to score a certain amount of points each week. It just is what it is. Well, everyone started cracking on the offense, and rightfully so. We've seen what has happened these last two weeks with a different offensive coordinator. But look, the Bills, and, and everyone hates when people talk about this, but their EPA on offense was tops in the league. Well, they were starting with the worst field position each and every week, and the defense wasn't ter- forcing any turnovers. Well, now we're seeing uh, some better play, but you know I feel like special teams – you know, everyone's going to blame the defense for the last game and Josh not hitting Gabe Davis in overtime. But the special teams, you have two holding calls or you have two penalties on your return units, which back you up inside the 10 yard line and you have two missed field goals and it ends up being an overtime loss. You know, special teams, if the Bills are going to get in it, the offense is going to have to stay hot. It's a fact of the matter. The defense has got to continue to grow with these new pieces and the special teams has got to be a consistent piece. But I think the special teams aspect goes hand in hand with the injury aspect because Fact. the 53 players, a lot of your key special teams guys are not playing teams because they're hurt or guys that have been your team's guys that you really, 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 really rely on are now playing 70 plays on defense or whatever, and they're not fully rested or they're not what they normally are as far as bringing that spark to the special team. Then you go ahead and you take your your elite returner and he gets run into by a jet ski before we even get to camp. And, you know, you you have these issues. So um, I think that's, to me anyway, special teams play. And, and obviously, you got to be coached well and you got to know what you're doing. But to me, it goes hand in hand with injuries and depth on your team. What does your depth look like? Do you have a lot of good players that are that are on the bench because they've got elite dudes in front of them and those types of things? So I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's special teams. And they're just – I don't know if it's due to the lack maybe of receivers that we have on this team. We just can't seem to make an explosive play on offense. We haven't taken the top off of a defense in quite some time. I know we got Diggs, but Diggs can't do it on his own. He's got to have guys to take pressure off of him, and we just haven't had that opportunity. And earlier in the year, they're trying, and that's where some of the turnovers came into play where, you know, you had – You know, you had Josh trying to force things downfield, but it just seems to me when you have big plays, you get energy and that energy creates momentum and you get rolling. All of our scores recently just seem like it's 10, 11, 12, 13 play drives. We haven't had those two play drives in quite a long time. And I think that's something else that we're missing too, just those explosive plays, especially on offense. You know what, Jerry? Well, it, it, it. well, real quick, Jerry, for what you're saying there, over the last two weeks, does it seem – because to me, it seems like um, there's a little bit more freedom for Josh in this offense to where it's like, look, you can kind of extend the play. Mm-hmm. And I think when Josh extends the play and once you start to see – even when he's not looking to run, but he gets out the pocket and kind of creates a new pocket wherever he goes. Right. I think those plays – because now you see Sunday night you know, or evening, Gabe right. did have a big play. It wasn't the touchdown that we're looking for, but he had a – I think it was a a 30 yard reception or so that, you know, it was a big play and you're right. We just haven't seen him as much this year. Do you think it's going to, we're going to see more of that going forward with Joe Brady's is, is it different from what you've seen the last two weeks versus the beginning of the season? I think as long as we continue to run the football and do those types of things, hitting the backside of the backfield where we get DBs to come downhill and maybe get confused, we can get over the top, but until we find a way to get bracketing off of digs, every play, and, you know, doubled and triple covered, uh, it's going to be tough because I just don't know if we have, um, if we have that type of explosive wide out. I know Gabe is fast and everything, not necessarily the greatest route runner, and he's done a good job of being a team player and he does whatever he can to to help be successful. Obviously, the last couple weeks, getting a game ball two weeks ago for his run blocking, which is a big deal at at the wide out spot. But um, I don't know. I mean, we just, we haven't seen that play where Diggs runs a post and Josh drops back and throws it as far as he can, you know, to got to try to go touch the goalpost. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. And we, I think we have to continue to do what we're doing to try to get those guys to really, really get in the backfield with their eyes and get downhill to try to stop the run and get them over the top with some play actions and things like that. John, you had something there. So I, I'm going to add to that a little bit. I think that uh, I think what hurt us early in the season, we knew what our what our receiver group looked like, and we knew we were going to face some problems. And I think the true miss was last year not developing Cook better, longer, and faster. And then this year, 
same with Shakir and Dalton Kincaid. And now that yeah. I think Dorsey started to do it, and now I think Joe Brady is really working the middle of the field. And that's going to open up those opportunities to take the top off like Jerry's talking about. But you're never going to be able to do that until you can threaten the middle of the field and bring those two high safeties eyeballs into the center of the field a little bit more where they have to support the second level of pass defense with the linebackers or the nickel corner, whomever's, you know, running around in that area. Uh, a lot of people just want uh, back to your earlier point, Spence, like, what do we have to fix? It's not like you walk into a room and flip a switch and everything is going to be okay. You can't really point at one thing. It's, it's the, it's all of it together. And when Eric was talking about the special teams, man, I just, I remember as a player, you know, you, you the team is punting from left to right, and you assume it's going to be a 35 to 40-yard punt. I would always start walking onto the field instead of at the 30 where it should have been fair caught. I would start walking back to the 15 because my expectation is there's going to be a hold. There's going to be something crappy. I mean, it happens so often, and it just makes you freaking lose your mind. All, all I want a special teams, just don't hurt me. Uh, yeah, yeah, you want to bust off a touchdown. If I have to have one touchdown for every seven holding calls, forget it. Don't give me – just give me something that's bland and vanilla, that doesn't make mistakes, that can keep us in the field position game because it's been bad. Yeah, I used to that's call that the slow Andre walk Roberts. back to the goal line. Like, okay, we all went out on the field. The ball was fair caught. Oh, there was a hold. And now we're all doing that slow walk back to the goal line. And you talk about – so and, and everything compounds. So, Spence, like what right. needs to change? Like Cook needs to make that play on the first uh, – Yes. Second yes. drive of the game where you yes. have a scripted play where you're not right. going to get that look again. They're never going to give you no safety help over the top, man-to-man -to -man right. defense on Cook because they now they know that you're going to run the wheel route because Josh checked to that. He waited for the look, and you got to make that catch. Well, instead of making that catch, then you punt it away. The Eagles go up seven. No, it's like everything compounds when you make mistakes, when you drop balls, when you have penalties, when you give them, you know, on their touchdown, their only touchdown drive in the first half. I understand what was a fourth and one, but you give them two free first downs with penalties. And that wasn't, and that was like before the officials completely took over the game. Like they were, it seemed like they were still calling it fairly fair at that point, but you give them two first downs because of penalties. It's like, you can't do those things because that keeps your defense on the field. Now they're wearing on a tired defense, and now all of a sudden you give up seven points. Well, I have a question for Eric, if I can ask Eric a question. Seeing him week in and week out the way you do and everything else, how much has the absence of, of Knox kind of held things up offensively in your mind? Do you think that with, you know, they were, you know, beginning of the year really, really excited to bring those two tight ends, him and Kincaid, into the into play and build a lot of the passing game into having both of them? Do you feel it? it's stagnated a little bit or do you feel that it, it hasn't? Well, I'll say this. It's allowed Dawson or it's allowed Dalton Kincaid to get more looks offensively, which has been great. And right. we're seeing his true potential. I don't think that slows down when Knox comes back. I think he takes some balls probably away from whether that's Shakir or Davis when he comes back. It probably hurts their game plan to an extent, although we've seen tons of David and uh, David Edwards that 6 0 lineman coming in the right. game playing tight end and Quentin Morris you know Dawson Knox caught a lot of grief now he was playing through injury it needed surgery and so trying to be a warrior out there probably hurt his reputation with the fans with some drop balls which probably were affected by a, a, a wrist that needed immediate surgery once they decided to you know kind of shut him down for a little bit but you know it's hard to say because at first, it seemed to open up the offense a little bit because it allowed Kincaid and the 11 personnel, which the Bills were so much more comfortable and used to right. running, to be in full effect. But we don't know what would have happened if they would have stuck with the 12 personnel or 11 and a half, like they like to call it, with <laughs> Kincaid out there. Yeah, it, it's interesting to see how it would have played out. That's a great question, Jerry. And it's going to be interesting when Dawson does come back and it's colder weather and probably sloppier times up in Buffalo, you know, at that point, do you get to the point where you're playing more 12 personnel and he's a, he's a true asset coming back. Okay. Well, uh, I'll say this. You, uh, oh, you got something? I'm sorry. You, you, you brought up a great point about Edwards in the game and having a guy in there, you know, in a heavy set like that, 
I, I think there's something to come with that. I think they're going to, I think you'll see a little bit more wide zone run. You might see a little, some, I don't know, gadget plays with Edwards in there. It makes sense. He's, he's, he's been in there enough now that you can add, you know, just like you said, the James Cook play was one play and we missed, right? So you can have David Edwards in there as your extra tight end. And if you see a weakness in the defense, you can scheme kind of a, a one-time shot play with a guy like that in the game where you're basically giving a run look and you can create a cool pass play off of it. I don't what know what it's going to be, but full, they ought to be doing it. Full disclosure, coming from a guy who did play that position and caught a touchdown pass. So uh, nice. go ahead. <laughs> that respect, I never caught a pass in the league. I always begged for one, but they would always say, uh, we're not replacing our center on the goal line in the backup when it's the riskiest snap probably we have all game. But in reference to that 6-0 lineman, a little nuance that I've liked what Joe Brady's done these last two weeks. So he'll line Edwards up on one side of the formation. He'll get the defense to set their look, and early in the game he'll send them in motion, see how the defense reacts. Well, what that does is – you know, a lot of times we like running our gap schemes at a three technique so we can get that guard and tackle right. with a double team and not the tackle and tight end on the double right. team. Well, they're doing that, and they're simply dictating the defensive fronts and getting the looks that they truly like just by moving Edwards around. And that's a tiny little thing, but as an O-line, we appreciate that because then throughout the week, we can rep over and over this look because we know we're only running against this look. If not, we'll flip him to the other side, and we'll get the look we want. Yep. Well, gentlemen, this is this has been great for me. I, I, I'm not. I don't want to end this now, but I, I see how much time we've been talking, so I don't want to take all of your time up. So before we get out of here, I have one last question for you, and I, I want all of your opinions on this. Um, so with the way the season has gone and the expectations shooting through the roof in Western New York for Bills fans. Now, being where we are, there's some criticism for Sean McDermott. Um, some people think it's fair. Some people don't. Where, where do you all sit with it? Do you think that Sean McDermott should be on the hot seat with the way this season has gone? Or do you think that, hey, we need to relax as, as Bill's Mafia and give this guy you know, some more credit? I, I think he deserves more credit. Now, you know, no one gets free passes in the National Football League. And this isn't a, you know sunshine and rainbows business i get that but the injuries on the defensive side of the football which is where sean's going to be judged mostly uh that contributed majorly to how he's calling plays as a defensive coordinator now i will say this his end of game passivity and the fact that the bills are 0 six in overtime games under sean mcdermott with josh allen as the quarterback is alarming now I read a stat today that Sean McDermott's 28 and 28 in one score games. Kyle Shanahan, who everyone in Western New York would beg to come and say he manages the end of games so much better than Sean. He has a losing record in one score games throughout his career. So, and that in Sean McDermott's, uh, that, that includes 2017 when we broke the playoff drop, but didn't have that talent of a team and 2018 when they had the most dead cap money in the NFL and the salary cap over twice as much as the next the second most team. So all that being said, I think, uh, and I honestly believe he, he deserves a longer leash than some bills fans are giving him, but I understand this is a results based business. We got to see how the rest of this season shakes out. I'm also not in the locker room. When I was in the locker room, we had a tremendous amount of respect for Sean and we love Sean McDermott. Now, assuming that they do now as well, and they play hard for him each and every week, no, there's no reason to move on from him. If there's more going on, we'll never know that. And so that's the only thing that could possibly play a factor. All right. I'm going to say I agree. Uh, the number of injuries on defense and the, we've had to plug and play new guys, young guys, guys, you know, just picking it up. We have guys on the field right now that aren't 100%. Um, yeah, I think it's a mistake. You, especially because you taking somebody, what, what are you going to do? Hire a failed head coach from somewhere else? Or are you going to take an offensive or defensive coordinator who you think is the hot commodity right now? And then you're, you're going to revamp your entire offensive philosophy or defensive philosophy? No, I, I think it's a mistake. I think that Sean McDermott's a good coach, a good leader. I think there's a good plan in place. I think we've really been hurt by injuries and, and other circumstances that uh, warrant he should he should continue to be the head coach. 
Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I agree with both of those guys, and I think I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit without you know being redundant. But I think the biggest thing about this is when you look at this football team, I can't tell you one time I looked at the field and said, you know what, they quit. Um, this team plays hard. And if they play hard, they play hard for a, a couple of reasons. One is they, they like and respect one another. And the other is they like and respect their head coach. And, you know, this is a team that, that is, is fighting their tails off. Every week they go out there and they, you know, hey, they might not play the best game, but it's not because of effort. Um, they do have a few deficiencies that they need to, to address in the, in the off season. I think, um, McDermott is a hell of a defensive coach. I think that they've been just hampered by, by injuries. And I think the biggest injury that, that really affected them is the Daquan Jones injury. I really do. I, mm-hmm. I talked to the first part of this, this podcast about, I thought they were not quite strong enough up the middle. Um, you know, Daquan's emergence and the way he was playing early was a huge part of that. They lose him, and then you lose a guy like Milano who can do so much at linebacker. He plays; he can play like a safety. He can play like a, a run stop and linebacker. Spa- splash plays all over the place. You lose him, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're having to maybe take chances or do things in the blitz game that you normally wouldn't do because you have a couple of guys that can hold it down. So that that's that's what I look at. I look at the message out of the locker room from week in and week out, and the message is positive. Um, I look at the way they play and they play hard and they play the right way. So in my estimation, you know, while we would like to finish games a little differently, I don't think this is, a, is an issue with, with the head coach. I think it's an issue with, with personnel. And when I say personnel, I'm talking about injury and I'm talking about, they still need a couple of pieces um, in some areas to, to help them along. So uh, no, I don't think that, that, you know, I look at McDermott in, in, he played with a guy, and, and I, you guys have heard this before. Me, you heard me say this before probably. His college teammate is a guy that I think is probably the best coach in the NFL. And his college teammate and one of his best friends is, is Mike Tomlin. And I look at McDermott, who grew up with a dad who was a coach. He was a, he was a wrestler. He's a tough guy. The influence of McDermott, all those different things. I mean, I think he's a, a wonderful fit for Buffalo. Like Eric said, is it every now and then are you going to be in the hot seat? Of course you are. You're you you run a football team, an NFL team, and that's a big deal. Um, but no, I think that um I think it would be silly to move on from McDermott. I think he's a good football coach. Yeah, and I'm hoping the rest of the way that they can get hot and so that you know this off season, it's right. not we're not having this conversation over and over. You know what I mean? Because sure. That is going to be the entire off-season conversation if we don't finish this season strong. And if we don't finish this season strong, I think the main factor is something out of their control. And it wasn't only injuries. It was a rash of injuries right. in a very short period of time, which from a coaching standpoint is tough. And you can put Von Miller in that group too because when he was injured and not playing early in the season and and obviously not back the way he will be, because I think next year he'll be back close to what he was because one of the benefits of not having his leg back the way it normally is this year is his snap count, his snap totals are way, way down. So he's not going to have to take as much time in the off season to heal up and get back to where he can train at full speed because he's not going to have the the wear on the tires like he normally would in a season. So this is kind of a season that's, you know, will help him in that aspect. But no, I agree, man. I mean, you know, the biggest thing is, too, when you're trying to get free agents, you don't want this kind of chatter going on around the league. Um, guys don't, you know, I know money's a big part of it, but they also want to play for a guy that they came in with. You know, you don't want them to shy away because they feel like he's going to be gone after one more year or whatever. You want that 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 message to be positive. Okay. I got three legends telling me to calm down as a fan. I was upset Sunday. I was upset. Forgive me. I'll, I'll, I'll go and delete the tweet. But ladies and gentlemen, this has been a, a wonderful conversation for me with three of the best offensive linemen in Bill's history. Uh, Eric, I know you have a, a, a podcast and a ton of other things that you do. You're like, you're literally everywhere. Uh, do you have anything that you want to highlight right now that you want us to kind of uh, make sure that everybody gets the word out about? Yeah, I'm really digging in on this Centered on Buffalo podcast, having a ton of fun, bringing on uh, former players from the opposing market each week. Maybe they're radio analysts. We break down the game, and and I'm having a lot of fun with that. Really looking forward to this offseason, more coaches and players on that podcast. Get some former guys uh, like these guys on the podcast as well. But 
that's been a lot of fun. I mean, I have my What's Next with Eric Wood podcast, which is more of a personal development podcast, and all of our highest ratings were Bill's guests. So he said, okay, well, let me separate that, and we'll do the Centered on Buffalo podcast. So that's been fun. Gotcha. All right. And then Jerry and, and John, if you two want to plug your shows and anything else you got coming up, we'll get on out of here. Well, of course, Wednesday nights at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, myself and Sarah Larson on uh, Line to Gain. Uh, we'll be on tomorrow night. We'll talk about uh, the past game against the Eagles. Sarah, of course, 55 straight games. So we like to have a good time talking about her visit to the uh, to the opposing team's town and what she did and all of that. We'll also get into the game and then this week, you know, of course, we have a uh, off week, so we'll probably talk a little bit about just the team in general and kind of where we go from here. I can't wait to hear about Philly fans. I just know she's going to have the best story in the world about Philly fans. She does. Uh, she does. John, what you got for us, man? <laughs> well, Monday nights, I got the Off Tackle Show with John Fina. Joe Miller is my co-host. Uh, I'm also available for uh, quinceañeras and bar mitzvahs, memorial services, uh, you know, if you if you want me, I could be there. I can MC your event. I don't care if it's a dog show or a cat show or whatever. And if you fly me back to Buffalo, I'm there. I'll meet in wings with uh, with Big Eric Wood, Jay Spencer King, and Jerry Ostrowski. It's been a great time, guys. Eric, That's you know we every every O line room has the smart ass. You obviously know who ours was. <laughs> right, I love it. <laughs> Hello. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, you all know how we do it with Buffalo Rumblings. It's your boy, Jay Spence the King. Y'all love each other, take care of each other, and live in peace. As always, stay positive, test negative. Go. Go.